Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as the team is getting the last AV bits set up here, I wanted to just do um, a welcome and introduction. Uh, this is the finalist presentations for the student design competition for this year. The theme was broadly assistive technologies, and the teams you will see took a wide interpretation of that. Um, the four teams you'll be seeing today uh, came out of an initial set of 65 submissions from 15 or so different countries. Um, <clears throat> those were called down to um, 12 finalists who came to the conference and presented in a poster it. session on Monday. And the there jurists selected these four teams as the finalists, um, and they will be giving 12-minute uh, presentations and a three-minute Q&A, which will be first led by the jury, and then if there's additional time, the we'll open it up to audience questions as well. <coughs> um, lest you worry, the, um, the teams have been instructed to assume that you have no knowledge of what has gone before. <laughs> Uh, so the, they are kind of going to bring you up to speed on what their problem was and then what their solution approach was. Um, uh, I want to acknowledge my co-chair, Anna Rhoda Jersey, um, down in front row, uh, and welcome the four teams. We should all give them a big round of applause for getting this far. And with that, I'm going to invite the first team up. Essentially, we're going to have a parade of the four teams, and that will be the end of the public part of the session. And then we will, um, the jury will convene and make some final determinations of the winner of this year's student design competition. Thank you. Hello. Oh. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, first, we want to just say that we will be sh playing a short but intense audio clip of a 911 call as part of the opening of this presentation. So, if you want to avoid that, just join us in about one minute. Imagine you were deaf. For you, meaning comes in motion. You see the hearing people around you speaking with their lips. But you speak with your fingers, your hands, your whole body. Your cell phone flashes instead of making a sound. You might go to a deaf bar to hang out on the weekends. In your everyday life, you might be different. But you found ways to adapt to the hearing world. Your deafness is just a part of who you are. Now, imagine you were deaf, and you or someone you love accidentally gets hurt. You probably can't call 911 and be understood. Maybe you can text 911, but they will not get your exact location. When the ambulance actually shows up, how do you talk to the EMTs? In an emergency, there is no time to find an interpreter. Imagine you were deaf. What do you do in an emergency? We designed LifeKey as in, to help answer that question. LifeKey is a software keyboard and mobile app our team has designed for and with deaf people. LifeKey makes it faster and easier to communicate with emergency services like 911. We began our design process by talking with people at the deaf clubhouse in Pittsburgh. I know a limited amount of sign language, but we got an incredible amount of help from this woman, Holly. Uh, she was more than an interviewee. She helped us communicate with deaf people at the club, and she was essential in helping us understand deaf culture. When we first showed up at the deaf club, we went in with a set of interview questions about how deaf people experience the healthcare system. 
We also made this interview tool to draw out insights about where deaf people run into problems in a typical visit to the doctor. However, we quickly found that we were asking the wrong questions. Deaf people told us that they had issues, sure, but they didn't seem to be all that bothered by them. For these people, this everyday friction with the hearing world was just a part of their life. Let's talk about deafness. We tend to think of deafness in pathological terms, as a physical condition, a disability. But we found that many of the deaf people we talked or signed with were proud of their deafness. In fact, they celebrated it. They identified as deaf with a capital D. And a key part of that identity is sign language. Many people think that sign is a visual translation of another language. This is not true. Sign languages worldwide have their own syntax, their own grammar, their own slang. And in sign languages, many features of spoken languages are implied by body language, facial expressions, and spatial grammar. This means that sign doesn't translate directly or perfectly into written or spoken languages. And for many deaf people, sign is their first language. A deaf person may be a fluent poetic speaker in sign, but still have literacy issues when uh, communicating over writing. So this learning all of this led to our first design insight. We're not dealing with a disability. Rather, we were dealing with a language barrier, and our solution had to accommodate that language gap. That lesson learned, we continued talking with deaf individuals, but in a less structured way. Once we left our assumptions behind, we were able to see a real and serious problem that the deaf community faced, communicating in emergency situations. This is a quote from a deaf mother, Sharon, who we talked to. Sharon found herself in an emergency, signing to her 10-year-old daughter, who had to interpret over the phone between the police and her mother. Sharon's story made us realize how difficult it was for deaf people to contact emergency services. This is another quote from a deaf mother, Holly, the woman who helped us so much. Holly to told us how when her daughter had a seizure, how even when the EMTs showed up, she was still terrified because she just could not understand what was going on. Holly is far from helpless. She reads, she reads lips very well and can speak. But in the stress of an emergency, with ambul ambulance lights flashing and EMT swarming her daughter, she still found herself unable to understand and communicate. Holly's chilling story gave us another insight. Even after emergency services arrive, many deaf people still struggle to communicate. These two insights made it clear to us that by focusing on deaf experience in emergency situations, we can actually make an, an impact. After we found our focus, we conducted a competitive analysis of existing solutions. We found physical tools, such as ICE in case of emergency cards, which had medical information, as well as other cards that helped deaf people communicate by pointing at pictures. We felt that these did not take advantage of deaf access to technology. In our experience, deaf people were avid users of smartphones. Knowing this, we, look, we also looked at existing emergency applications, and we found that these apps mainly focused on helping you quickly compose your initial message to 911, but failed to help you throughout the rest of the SMS conversation. They also failed to help once the emergency responders arrive, arrived on scene. From our competitive analysis, we gained the insights that we must take advantage of deaf access to technology and also provide support for people throughout the entire emergency. We needed to learn the other side of the story too. To do this, we spent time in the Allegheny County Emergency Services Busy Call Center, observing operators and dispatchers, asking questions, and trying to understand the technology they use. In a typical emergency call, the injured person first makes contact with an operator. As soon as the call connects, the operator gets the caller's address, then verifies their location. Then the operator gathers information about the emergency, guiding them through medical procedures if necessary. Operators reference a set of protocols to identify an alphanumeric code that sums up the emergency. An emergency dispatcher then uses these codes to coordinate with the police, fire department, and EMS to get the right personnel to the emergency. For decades, deaf people have used the teller typewriter, or TTY, to communicate. A TTY is essentially a phone with a keyboard that uses the landline phone network to send text messages to a receiving TTY. It's recommended that all deaf people have a TTY in their home in case of an emergency. 
However, TTY machines are of no help if you aren't near a landline. More recently, emergency call centers in the US and other countries are in the process of adopting the capability to SMS text with emergency services. Text to 911 is a huge deal for the deaf and hard of hearing, but texting has its own problems. Messages must be processed by the emergency call center's technology, which adds a significant delay. With that delay, texting doesn't give you the, that same comforting sense of talking with someone live. It's also important to remember that deaf individuals use a language that's fundamentally different than its spoken counterpart. These issues combined can make it difficult for deaf people to communicate with emergency services, even over text. Once we understood how complicated the emergency services system is, we decided that our solution had to work within this complex system, not outside of it. With all this newfound knowledge, we generated ideas for potential solutions. We came up with concepts for smart keychains, digital ICE cards, apps with sign-based interfaces, and more. We then took all these concepts back to the Deaf Clubhouse to quickly evaluate them with the deaf people we've been talking to. As it turned out, the idea that resonated the most was one of the simplest, a piece of software that could help the deaf talk to 911 faster, easier, and with more confidence. With this concept, we began whiteboarding and paper prototyping to flesh out features and workflow. We also used storyboarding to imagine how the keyboard and its features might be used in different emergency situations. We then moved into interactive prototypes in Balsamic and Envision. We brought these interactive prototypes to the clubhouse and to the Emergency Services Center for feedback. From deaf users, we found that we needed to make the visual hierarchy more clear and that the keyboard needed a light, lighter, friendlier aesthetic. The 911 dispatch center liked the idea, but reiterated that the most important information to them is location. So here we introduced LifeKey, an emergency communication tool for the deaf. Once installed, the LifeKey keyboard is easily accessible from within the SMS messaging app. LifeKey immediately populates the text field with location information in the first message. You can then quickly summarize the emergency with a just few taps, each tap making the description more detailed. The interface focuses on nouns and verbs and automatically fills in the language in between, making it clear for deaf users with low language literacy to explain their emergency. A persistent yes, no, I don't know allows you to quickly send common responses. A visual medical reference helps you to clarify any medical guidance the operator might give. If you need to reconfirm your exact location, you could do that without leaving your SMS conversation. Once emergency personnel arrives, arrives on scene, the LifeKey mobile app will allow deaf users to speak by typing using text-to-speech and listen using speech transcription. The app also lets you look back through your SMS conversation and speaks aloud any message so you don't have to repeat yourself to bring the on-scene personnel up to the speed. When we brought our last interactive prototype to the Deaf Clubhouse and showed it to Holly, she slapped the table and said, that's badass. I want to be the first person to use that. We hope that she never has to use 911 again, but we designed LifeKey in case she or someone like her does. But what we realized throughout the process was that LifeKey could be used for anyone who lives in a country where they don't speak their first language. Um, or it could be used by you and me. The interface makes it faster to communicate no matter what language you speak. Each component of LifeKey is pretty much in use in some other app today. There's nothing groundbreaking, but sometimes the solution doesn't need to be a totally new idea. It just has to be the right mix of ideas. LifeKey takes existing UI and technical innovations and uses them to a new end to help a community when they find themselves in trouble. Thank you.
Uh, could you speak a little more to the functions that that are available once the emergency provider arrives? Um, having having ha had uh, deaf relatives, a, a paper and pad is really an effective way for an, a, a deaf person to uh, communicate with a hearing person. I'm curi kind of curious how you sort of emulated that. Um, yeah, so we found that uh, Paper and pen is a common fallback, but it's actually not a very good solution because of the language barrier. Um, sometimes words can have multiple meanings, it, like an English word can have multiple meanings in sign, which can lead to miscommunication. Um, sometimes problems with grammar can mean that the deaf person isn't well understood by the person that they're writing to. Um, and we actually, a couple of times in the Deaf Club, we had people uh, pull up the Google search app and just use Google's voice translation to he like sort of hear what we were saying. Um, so our, the idea uh, with the mobile app was sort of to take that existing behavior and just sort of replace that pen and paper pass off um, so that you can sort of maintain the flow of a conversation and you're not passing something back and forth. Um, and also to increase the quality of the information that's being passed back and forth. So, so was the responder typing text on the, in the app? Or the responder would be speaking and the app would be transcribing. And then the deaf person can type and speak to the responder. Yeah. Uh, this next question is channeling Wendy, who has laryngitis, um, <laughs> uh, who wrote on a piece of paper. <laughs> um, can you tell us a little more about the design evaluation that you did? The competitive analysis? Excuse me? User testing or? Yes, user testing. Uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, we basically um, created this like low fidelity prototypes in paper forms, and we uh, um, we actually ran through a Wizard of Oz sort of um, user testing with the deaf um, people at the clubhouse, um, and we as we iterated, um, like we shared the main takeaways um, as it as it changes throughout the iteration you could see how the visual hierarchy changes. That's because um, they wanted um, something clear, a light, um, lighter, and, and also before we had the iteration of button, like starting from the bottom to the up, but then that visual hierarchy like went against the normal affordance of how, how people actually read things. So um, there was a lot of um, challenge in terms of that. And we decided to come up with our final solution, um, as you could see in the app. Does, does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, in the app there is like... Wendy says yes. Yeah. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, in the scenario, you show uh, the emergency responders texting to the injured person. Is that an accepted practice at the moment? Is when um, there's yeah, a yeah. So, yeah. So uh, a very common fallback uh, for a long time has been writing back and forth with deaf people. Um, and more recently, we found that a lot of deaf people pass it back and forth a phone with like the Notes app open. No, I meant. Um, during, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, looked like, yeah. it looked like during transit or during the time when the emergency yeah. responders hadn't gotten there yet, it said, you know, my name's Daniel or whatever, right, I'm going right. to be assisting you today. Is that, so, is there um, a smooth path to that interaction? I think you're talking about the text on 911 service. Yeah. So through our research and talking to the um, Allegheny County Emergency Center, they have um, as of 2014, the U.S. has started rolling out text to 911, that capability to SMS 911. It's just SMS, so no pictures or videos. Um, so Allegheny County Emergency Services does have that capability now. So we want to play upon that and some of the existing limitations of that. For example, the time delay, um, it takes up to 15 seconds because of all the processing that they're doing with the messages to get it into their system. Um, and, and like we said, it, it doesn't really have that same comforting guided feel. You just open it and see a blank message. So, um. I'm not sure if this would um, help answer your question. Do we have to stop? Okay. The, uh, we found out that the dispatchers always keep contact with the people that they send over. 
And so we do not get to, the people do not get to text directly to the EMTs in the ambulance, but they're being updated from the, the dispatchers. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank um, you. Just one quick question. Uh, after you did the digital prototype and you, uh, you, you went back there uh, and you only got uh, an opinion from, uh, from one person or did you uh, go through another round of uh, user testing? No, so we had, a, we had a sort of set of about nine deaf people that we regularly talked to, so we ran it by each of them um, at sort of every stage, the mid-fi, the low-fi, and the high-fi prototype. Hi. <laughs> yep. We are a team of lame mates and oh. And my name is Yu Kyung Lee from Postech in Korea and my other members of team are Sang Lee and Yuno Kang. We made a car sensing system for the deaf. So, what is a car sensing system for the deaf? As you can see in this logo, uh, this is the product that detects the car behind the deaf. So it detects the car instead of uh, deaf, and it gives vibration feedback to the user. Our research process consists of four stages. First is first group interview for problem investigation, and second, online survey for first concept feedback, and second group interview and user testing. And after the user testing for the prototype feedback, we made a final version of second pro prototype for the advanced research. I will show the picture of the second prototype at the end of the presentation. Uh, for the first group interview, we visited Poang Association of the Deaf to find their needs in daily life. We asked them about the daily problems, and one of the problems was about not realizing the car behind them. So actually they said they usually continuously turn around their uh, surroundings to detect cars, and it's very tedious. So we set up the goal, suggesting a solution of this problem. Let me talk about the significance of our problem. Uh, these are the graphs of the Korean road situations, and it shows that there are a lot of one-lane narrow roads. Also, at the bottom, there's a map. It is a map of Gangnam Station in Korea, and there is a lot of roads without a distinction between a sidewalk and a street. So we should be careful about our surroundings while walking on the roads. And in this case, hearing usually plays a significant role. However, people with hearing impairment don't have the ability to detect cars, so it is very dangerous for those people. For solving this problem, we made a first concept design. Our product composed of two parts. First one is car detecting part, and second one is feedback part. Uh, on the neck, there is a green one. This is a car detecting part, and it is hung on a neck, like a neck band earphone, and it faces the rear, so it can detect the car behind the deaf. When it recognizes a car, it transmits a signal to the yellow feedback part on the wrist, and then this feedback part gives the vibration feedback to the user. For the first concept design, we proceeded with an online survey with deaf students in Daegu University to get some feedback for the first concept design. And they gave us feedback. Uh, one of the feedback was about the location of the product. Uh, actually, the detecting part was hung on the neck, but they said it seems like inconvenient. Also, we asked them about the location of the feedback part, 
and they said uh, most of them wanted it to be attached to the wrist. So for the solution, we decided to make a detection part to be attached to the waist instead of a neck and make a feedback part to be worn on the wrist. From the feedback of the online survey, we made a second concept design. Now you can see the green car detecting part is located on the waist, not a neck. And we proceeded with a second group interview with six staff students in Daegu University to get some feedback for the second concept design. And they said it would be better if the detecting part, which is located on the waist, could be attached and detached freely. So we decided to make it as a clip form. Also, they said they are usually exposed to a lot of vibration alarms, so they cannot distinguish the vibration. So we decided to make it as an independent platform with only this specific function. Also, we asked them whether they wanted, want to know the information of the car direction. However, they said direction of the car is not needed, so we decided to make a change of algorithm simpler. Based on the feedback from the online survey and the second group interview, we made the first prototype. This is the pictures of the first prototype. The left one is car, det car detecting part, and the right one is feedback part. And the car detecting part has two sensors. One is for recognizing a car horn, and one is for recognizing a distance between the user and the car. When the detecting part recognizes a car, it gives some Bluetooth signal to the feedback part, so the feedback part can make a vibration to the user. Actually, there are two conditions for recognizing a car. First one is when the car horn exists, and second one is when the car is waiting for the pe person without a car horn. And based on the final version of first prototype, we proceeded with user testing with four deaf students in Daegu University. And the overall response of the user testing was very positive, and they gave us a lot of feedback that could improve our product. First one is that product is a little weak and heavy, and second one is about the vibration intensity. Third one is uh, about the feeling of the feedback part. And fourth one is about the time delay. So based on the feedback of this user testing, we made an improvement of our prototype. So for the heaviness part, we reduced the number of the sensors and batteries by using a transformer module, so it becomes much lighter. Uh, for the vibration intensity, we removed the case of the feedback part so it could give the vibration directly to the user. Also, for the filling part, we made a soft silicone band instead of a hard case with a string. And finally, for the time delay, we made a change of our algorithm. So this is the pictures of the second prototype. Also, we made a car detecting part as a brooch form for the stability purpose. Yeah, and actually there's a similar product which is made by Garmin. And however, there, there is a big difference between this product and our product. This is the cost. Actually, the product from the Garmin is about $500, but however, our product is under $100. And from the interview with the deaf people, they said they really wanted to use the assistive, assistive technologies for them, but since it is very expensive, they couldn't use it. So I think for the affordability part, uh, our product is good. 
and yep, this this is the, our second prototype, and we think this design is didn't just pop out of nowhere, from the problem investigation to making a real prototype, we interact with the deaf and we actually try to reflect their opinions in our design. So I think this design can be a real design for the deaf. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions? Hi, um, you said that one of the feedbacks you received was that they have lots of, they receive various vibration signals yeah. and they don't know which one is which. Yeah. Have you discussed with them the advantages and disadvantages of having independent devices in, in, in the sense that I, I, I you know, envision a day where they would have like five devices like this on their wrist doing different things. Uh, was, was there a discussion about this? Actually, for this part, uh, the reason why we asked them about the kind of the vibration was that we we couldn't decide whether uh, we make an independent part or uh, we make it uh, as a function of the other device. And they said they usually uh, they they have used that uh, uniform form of the function, but they said since they cannot hear the alarm, so the only f form of the alarm for the deaf are vibrations. And since there's always vibration around them, so they cannot dis distinguish the vibration. Yeah, so we decided to make it independent form. I have a first question from me and then one from Wendy. <laughs> the first question from me is, um, did you take the sensor and algorithm out to the street and actually try it with real cars in, like, in a, on a roadway situation? I saw the laboratory testing with the foam core car, but I didn't see anything. I didn't hear you say anything about how well this actually worked. Actually, we we did user testing with not real car since real car is uh, dangerous. So I think it is a little difficult. And since we don't have cars, so it's very hard to using a car. Uh, instead of the real car, we use the uh, hard yeah, yeah breadboard exactly. pan and breadboard? yeah <laughs> and. Uh -huh. Actually, we we sized. Measure the yeah, size. we we measure the size of the every kind of car, and we find found out the common range of the car. So this can detect that that common range of the car, and actually, uh, we will participate in the startup program for our South Korea's government, and we are planning to make a more precise product for this prototype, yeah. Thank you. Um, Wendy's question is, uh, what was the biggest surprise in all of your process? What, what? Sorry? What was the biggest surprise, surprise? in the process? Did you, and did anything? <laughs> I think um, they. I think um, we are. We we think we thought that um, they use um, the device very well for disabled because. Uh, but they think they thought that um, they are very um, difficult to use and very uh, expensive, so they doesn't use. I uh, didn't use at all. So I think we we thought that. Um, if we make make it more cheaper than other products, and if we make 
um, more make it use uh, using more o uh, open source then they can make it better yeah. <laughs> i'm sorry and, <laughs> and this is very simple design a simple circuit so if you have some con uh, soldering skill you can even make it easily at home yeah thank you okay. yeah. okay. so while they set up the av apparently takes a lot of time uh, does anybody have any question quickly to yeah. fill the you. you can still stay <laughs> okay no questions excellent Excellent. This is record. Hello. Good afternoon. Uh, hi. Uh, we are a team from uh, IDC, IIT Bombay, and uh, we've designed a product to help uh, visually impaired people type faster on smartphones. Meet Ruchir. He is 25 years old, a digital marketing professional in Mumbai, and he was born visually impaired. When we met him first, we were really excited about, like, curious about how he uh, uses technology, and he was also quite proud and very fond of talking about how technology makes his life better every day. So, uh, a, a smartphone is not only access to information, easier access to information, a way to communicate for these people, for blind people, uh, a big uh, convenience, but more importantly, it's, it brings independence to their daily activities. Uh, from our interactions with him, one thing that we noticed that he had a lot of trouble with was text input. And if you're familiar with uh, how accessibility works with a smartphone, you would know that typing with a screen reader on is extremely difficult. So this is how it's done. You would put your finger anywhere on the QWERTY keyboard layout, and the screen reader or talk back would read out which character your finger is on. Then you would move your finger to the right key, and when you hear that you're on the right key, then you would lift your finger or double tap to enter the key. So you can imagine how this can be a little cumbersome. Here's a little sample. F, T, T, V, space. Yeah. So uh, why we think it's an important problem to solve is because there are 39 million people living with visual impairment in the world, of which 12 million are in India. And of these, 90% uh, live in low-income settings, and the most affordable form of technology could be the Android phone, which these days is as low as $30. We checked today. Uh, when we looked at how we can make uh, typing an easier process for visually impaired people, we realized that tactility is a very important aspect. Uh, on a physical keyboard, they can go on, go really high, on high, really high speeds. Sorry. And uh, anybody who's used a gaming joystick would know that uh, you, can, you can use a joystick without taking your eyes off the screen. So that's a really good example of, uh, of a device that, that's supposed to be used without having to look at it. And uh, another example we, uh, that we would refer to is a stylus and, a, sorry, what's a stylus in slate. It's a device used by uh, blind people to write in Braille. So uh, it's a stencil uh, in which the, ref uh, the references are provided by the, st the cells that you can see, the rectangular cells. So on a, f on a typical smartphone, which is predominantly featureless and flat, the edges are the only tactile references actually available, which you can touch with your fingers. So we thought about how if we can extend uh, text input to the edges. So can we just type from the edges alone? Turns out this could be a potentially good idea. So we found, came across research where uh, somebody studied typing performance of blind users on a touch screen. And uh, the results were that the peripheral keys such as Q, A, P, L, M, and of course spacebar, uh, were uh, blind people were able to type at an accuracy of 90% or above, whereas the ones in the middle were a lot more difficult to get, and they averaged around 20%. So we went ahead and looked at how we can do this. And we grouped the characters together so that we could create larger buttons. So uh, in this layout, 
A typical, uh, the size of these keys is almost eight times as big as a QWERTY key would be. And we stuck to uh, the ABC grouping of um, three by four key for key keyboard layout because a lot of the users would have used a T9 phone with a, t uh, with a tactile keypad before they bought an Android phone. And in many cases, they continue to use their tactile phones along with a key, uh, T9 because they're still not completely com along with their Android because it's still not completely comfortable typing on QWERTY. And another feature that we thought would be really important is that when you're typing, and if you can't see what you're typing, you, can't, you don't have visual feedback, we need to substitute that with immediate audio feedback. And we brought uh, this context cue right to the front rather than some uh, gesture two, three layers below. So uh, if you tapped anywhere on the left when you're typing, uh, it would, the system would read out the word that you're editing and tapping anywhere on the right would give you the sentence that you're editing. So this is uh, a demo of how it works. G H D E editing he J K L J K L M N O full stop comma question mark exclamation mark hello yeah so it works on multi tab and we also built in a few gestures to go with it for example mouse uh, the cursor can be moved around cursor left editing hell cursor left editing H E L Cursor right editing hell. Cursor right editing hello. And to scroll, scroll through suggestions if prediction were to be implemented. Hey. Hello. Her. He's. He. Yeah. Uh, and also to toggle between cases. Uppercase. Capital K, lowercase, W F Y. So we built a prototype of this uh, with some of the basic features. We just made the uh, A to Z characters alone, and uh, we met a few users with it. Uh, initial reaction of a lot of the users was extremely positive, and they were happy to know that someone was working on this, and happy to know, uh, find that it was easy to use as well. This is one of our users trying it out. His feedback was that it's great that it works, but then in some situations he may not have both his hands free. So a one hand mode would be preferable. We were, we're trying to, uh, that would be our next step with trying to figure it out. And also in, um, in multi tap, uh, when you type, uh, when you press the first key, for example, it would say A, and then you tap twice to get, and you hear B, and then a C when you tap thrice. So uh, his feedback was that if a user knew, well, wanted to type C and he tapped thrice, can we just, can the system just say C and, and skip through A and B? So uh, that's uh, a good feedback, and we want to test if, and make sure it's not confusing to any user. So we need to, we'll build another prototype, uh, we'll build another version and see how that goes. Uh, another user was, I'm delighted to use it. G. Okay. Speed button. Double P. Double X. W. T. 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 U. So she was just trying it out. And Ruchir, we took it back to Ruchir, and of course he picked it up very quickly. He learned how to use it, and he had something to say. Space. G. H. I. D. D E A. This is a good idea. So uh, we also did some quantitative uh, study. Uh, we took this passage uh, as an as a good example, and we also removed uh, uh, punctuation marks and special characters so we could uh, compare it to a QWERTY. And also, uh, we turned off predictions in QWERTY and compared the two. And uh, with about an hour of training, our users were able to type on an average of 1.7 times faster than they could on QWERTY, that they were, and they were quite, already quite well versed with QWERTY. So that gives us uh, hope that it could be a really good solution that we can maybe build and ship. So for future work, we're looking to see how we can uh, extend this to uh, text input in Indian languages. That will be a next step. And uh, we're also toying around with swipe model, uh, where uh, 
we're looking at how, uh, so for example, to type G, you would tap once, and to type H, you would uh, swipe in from the corner. Uh, and similarly, for the third uh, character, you would swipe in a lot more. So uh, uh, this is, again, uh, we need to build it and test it. But this is, we'd put that in future work, things that we'd like to do. And uh, yes, like we mentioned before, single hand mode. And uh, as a training tool, we, uh, we use tactile markers on the phone screen to, to get people to get uh, familiarized with the keyboard. And we thought, what, uh, what if this was a permanent part of the phone and the rest of the OS also allows for interactions with it using these tactile markers? So this is one layout that we tried out otherwise. Uh, so then work could also extend into general OS navigation and other interactions with it. Well, thank you for listening. Questions? Uh, two somewhat related questions. Uh, first off, did you think about using the, the T9 algorithm where using language model it would disambiguate the, between the three keys rather than using the multi-key strategy? Uh, we, we've not built any prediction into the prototype at all, so we've not been able to test it, but when, when, we, did dis when we discussed it, uh, we thought this is a concern. We, it could potentially be dis, um, distracting. So if you wanted to type H-E-L-L-O, you would prop, in the T9 model, you would hear G-D-J-J-M. Uh, could this potentially be disturbing, uh, like distracting from what you actually want to type? If that's a concern that we have. But yes, we will uh, build it and test. OK, my second question is, if you think about the perimeter of a cell phone, it's, it's really a pretty um, good amount of screen real estate. I was wondering if you ever tried experimenting with your users with actually having single key per letter arrangements. Uh, phones come in a lot of different sizes. And in fact, the lesser expensive, the more affordable ones are much smaller. And if you went down to that size, it could get really tiny, would beat the point. And okay. maybe the large size of the key is actually a big strength of this model. So let's stick to that. Uh, channeling Wendy, um, so how many people did you talk to at each phase? I mean, we heard about the one that helped you locate the problem. What? Yes, uh, Richard uh, was part of the design throughout, but uh, off we showed our prototype to uh, around 10 people, but the quantitative analysis is from three, as we uh, we've got the data for three people. So the proper, uh, the quantitative testing was done on three users. I had a question. Um, some of your users, uh, the footage that you showed, had them holding the phone in kind of unusual ways. Did, was that, I mean, I saw, I think, two of your users holding a phone in a way that I wouldn't have expected. Sure. Uh, um, <laughs> Sorry. So yeah, I was just curious how, how prevalent that was in your user community and what do you think you would change yeah. about the? Oh, uh, we were surprised. So when we did, when we introduced the product, we gave, gave it to them with instructions as to, as to how to hold it. But then uh, they are a lot more used to uh, navigating the phone like this, and to explore and get familiar with the layout, they prefer to do this. So they could find out what's where, and then uh, for the testing, however, they held their phones like this to type because otherwise you wouldn't be able to type very fast. Uh, just a good question. Those three users with the quantitative analysis, they were uh, all visually impaired? They were all? Visually impaired? Yes, they were all. All of the users that we've taken feedback from. And uh, were they experienced in the QWERTY keyboard uh, with TalkBack? Uh, to, so if you just ask them, they, they said they were comfortable typing with QWERTY, <laughs> but then this particular example, when we uh, actually went through typing this passage, they were actually happier typing. We were delighted that they could type faster. We have probably a minute for the uh, for any audience questions. Meanwhile, the next group can go and set up, please. Any audience questions? None. In that case, we can thank the speakers. Thank you. So uh, hello everyone. Uh, we are like I'm Vikram and this is Harmeet. We are a couple of students, undergraduate students from the pre-final year at 
IIT Guwahati. And as you can see, like we have worked on the concept of time. So our project is titled Sathi, making it easier for kids with learning disability to understand the concept of time. So like time can have different meanings for us, like how we perceive time, it can be in the form of time management, like you're always running after, running short of time and whatever numbers. And all of us must also agree to the fact that kids have a heavy fascination for gadgets, watches, like you can see them whenever there's a gadget besides, they'll be like trying to touch it and all. But when it comes to kids and about perceiving time, numbers, hands, oh God, it's like just like it's confusing to them. So the idea like in the best case scenario, like just uh, take for granted that a kid can even figure out that okay, it's 8 a.m., what exactly an hour or a difference of 30 minutes means, what is the concept of time pace and all that, that's very tough for them to like perceive. So like in the scenario, it's possible like you ask a kid, okay, what's the time? And you might hear up responses like, I don't know or something, even though the kid will da daily be wearing the watch. So when we started, we started with just two words, assistive technology, seems so concise, like, but trust me when I say it's so vast, so vast, like, when you dive into it, assistive technology, you have the definition open to yourself. It can be any form of assistance. It can be any form of disability. You can do whatever. So the process that we followed entirely can be like summed up in this uh, tracing of the alphabet S, which is also the first letter of our project, Sathi. So we started with literature review, field visits, contextual inquiry, affinity analysis, uh, finalizing the problem, competitor analysis, conceptualization, finalizing, again, coming to the solution followed by your user testing and then some moderate, moderate iterations. So to start with the field visits, we started with a place called Shishu Sharthi. It's happen, it happens to be in Guwahati only uh, and a wonderful center for rehabilitation and training for multiple disabilities. There you can like see kids uh, in like numbers around 300 and 400 being enrolled. Age group, again infants, like toddlers to even 20 years of age. And this was where we carried out the contextual inquiry, the entire process of empathizing with the user and like diving into them, diary entries. You have teachers, uh, like they say them to be caretakers and all. So they have experiences of above 30 years in this domain and the interactions with them and how, this is how we like got in the insights. And then uh, from two words, what we did was like we diverged into a big domain into like uh, depending on what sort of people we have at hand to like research with and some other factors we finalized and then gradually again narrowed down on these five things being motor skills, self-help, communication, social skills, and cognitive skills as the areas that could be tapped upon. So we like again went back and this was like a sequence of field visits, some eight to nine field visits, and then every time the observation that we would make would be followed by like a brainstorming session with the five team members. We had a very good guide as well from the interaction design stream only. So we were like having constant feedbacks from them, discussion with the caretakers and all. Gradually what we did was the affinity analysis and all, and then it was like we narrowed down to the idea of like self-help and then finally the lack of time perception. So once we were like, uh, okay, let's settle on the lack of time perception as the domain, this is where we started with the competitor analysis, like uh, getting to know as to what exactly is the state of art, as in how people are doing. And uh, if you like really look into it, there are actually good products in the market. There's one very promising product, means we even took inspirations from them, but then we are talking about kids with learning disabilities. I'll not name the product. It's in the form of a mobile app. So a kid with learning disability, how exactly do you expect him to navigate through a complex app? I appreciate the idea, but then when it comes to application, that is where the lacking was. So uh, like what exactly is Sathi? To understand that, you need to understand what do we mean by our users? Like what exactly it means to be a uh, kid with like learning disability and all? So a kid is like uh, accustomed to uh, school activities. You, he can communicate through flashcards. Now what exactly do we mean by flashcard? For a kid who is not able to communicate properly, when you ask him, okay, do you want to eat food or do you want to listen to a song? He's not gonna outrightly answer you. You show them two cards, there's a guitar, there's a apple, and then the kid will simply point out to, okay, this is the apple, and then you realize that, okay, this is what, uh, that's how the communication happens. They relate more strongly to voices of guardians, like if I go and ask, okay, that might scare them away, but the native language is something then they again that easily understand. They understand colors, usually the bright colors, they respond to gentle sounds. And you can see to the right, we have like pictures of flashcards here. Uh, so 
now we'll like jump on to the features of Sathi and I'll go on explaining the solution uh, one by one with the features. So the most important feature I would rather say in Sathi is that it's a familiarity based concept. Sathi uses concepts and activities like I said most familiar to users thereby making it highly effective. We are using familiar voices, use of native languages, visuals similar to flashcards and sequence of activities that the kids are accustomed to. So you can see icons and flashcards, they transform into our icons in Sathi. What exactly do we mean by icons and Sathi? So this is how our watch operates. Our solution Sathi is not only a watch, it comes complemented with a mobile app as well. Now if you like look into here, uh, this thing symbolizes our alarm clock. This is our toothbrush uh, and Apple uh, school bus. So this like wake up, brush your teeth. Now it's time for breakfast, go to school. How this works out, you see the blue color in the background. This is the filling up transition which like denotes the time running out or the timer. This event here to the left on the small is like the event that is gone, the current event that's going on and the event about to come. So this is like a transition that happens like this. There were multiple varieties of transitions that we uh, like tested and I'll be coming back to them uh, soon. But just to like, uh, I have the prototype here on the watch. This is a Moto 360 that happens to be a smartwatch. But then just to explain, uh, I have this video here. Yeah, so uh, as you can see, the transition is like gradually filling up. Let's eat now, Lucy. And this is like the voice of the caretaker for or the parent. And this is how uh, the reminder. So you can like decide what reminder is going to come, when it is going to come, what should be the frequency and all. So uh, these are like the different icons that we came up and yeah, time is like just simplifying it with the idea of flashcards. So this was like one feature. The next feature happens to be the permission based model where the solution has a permission based approach. Now a mother is someone that helps at home. A teacher is someone that the kids relate to at school. So what we mean by is like, say you are the master, you are the parent and you have a kid. I am the teacher. Now you decide what part of timetable can I control. Basically you are giving me permissions to have access to some part of things and uh, depending on the permission that you have, you can like view the events, edit events, verify creden credentials and so on. Uh, what this means is like you can like set new events and voice reminders and that can again happen in collaboration if the event is being shared by you. This also ensures that the reminders are not going to be machine language based which is again very important because kids really get scared especially in, in these, this scenario. Now uh, like to yeah so uh, just to like give you a demo we also have an app prototype we have a url for the poster if you're having an iphone or something you can like demonstrate but how this app is going to work like this is uh, say you have the list of kids here you click on the kids list and then you get about the daily activities of them then you can like say uh, you would want to like uh, add or something or something like you have the icon here so like we want to like say change this icon you click here uh, you go to the gallery you choose this picture you do here and yeah this is here so you confirm it you can like add on events uh, confirm and so this is how it's going to work you like as soon as you confirm this uh, this is how the event is going to come up here so now the best part about this is like what this does is in the end it like develops a deeper sense of relationship so what happens is like once kids are not communicating that well even if uh, you look at very good scenarios people tend to like have a separation from the kid and what we are talking about is like bridging up because you are like uh, observing the kid very closely here so uh, now coming on to testing and redesigning part like we carried out with the user testing where we had like two kinds of users based on the iq the first one being mild from the iq category 50 to 69 and moderate from the iq category 35 to 49 on, um, and we like did the testing with 11 participants from age group of 9 to 14 years. Now what we did for the testing was like as you can see in the picture first of all we like made them familiar with the cards as to what exactly the graphics represent. We made the teachers familiar with the card as to what exactly we mean by each of the graphics and then finally we tested it out here with uh, uh, means, uh, wristwatch kind of straps attached to basically a video player. So. Based on the testings, we like came up with the following observations. Moderate category of the kids, I'll like go back here, moderate category with the IQ of 35 to 49, which is like the lower IQ fared better. So uh, uh, what that means is like 
oh i'm very sorry for it so what this means is like uh, there was a scope of progressive learning approach so the kids who are like faring better need not like go through the entire process they can like you can increase difficulty level gradually like uh, make them more and more self dependent depending on how easily they are like able to navigate through circular transitions like i mentioned circular transition like this pattern on the watch was way better than a linear transition and smaller messages with snooze pattern the way you like go through alarms are like way more effective because longer messages kids again do not understand multiple reminders you are scaring them they will not pay attention to you so this was the like most important observation that we had and like we immediately took it this was like what happens is in case of an apple what we showed was a graphical apple now kids relate very strongly to like apples if you like have a app picture of an apple from a real life so uh, what we mean is like you should have even have the uh, feature of like changing in the icons and you can like click a picture and then put in there so this obviously leads to behavior changes now if you ask dave like what's time and he might be able to like say it's time for lunch so for future scope these are the following things accommodating children with higher support needs as in like uh, incorporating needs for like say communicating like i want to go to the toilet or something there was no testing that we did with reminders followed by a positive reinforce re uh, reinforcement so if there is somebody from psychology background you would understand what i mean by this uh, positive reinforcement this can actually work wonders but i'll not comment because we have not done anything on this changing in daily time table and then this would totally disrupt the uh, means the process because kids are like getting used to it gradually and so uh, basically this was our poster and so uh, do we have time how much time do we have i have a 2 minute video to like wrap up the entire thing yeah. we have a time okay thank you so this is like the 2 minute video i'll not go again with the slides to recap you'll we'll just like look at the video and understand whatever we have talked about me tape Dave is a kid who suffers from learning disability. Dave wears a regular wristwatch. However, when asked, "Hello, Dave," what's Dave? You can take questions, then then you can show after. Yeah, sure. Can I have somebody who can like set the video? Uh, so, can you clarify a little bit more about what the what interactions actually happen between the watch and and the child? Uh, watch. sorry uh, what interactions between the watch and the child as in in terms of uh, when are you talking about when the child is interacting i i right i see displays of reminders but i'm just not yeah sure yeah so what, what uh, so what we are talking about has. here is that the child is not going to do anything because we do not expect them to like navigate through things so you have a watch on your hand things are just going to like say it's a breakfast time so there's going to be a picture of an apple and it there will be a uh, timer filling in and then there will be reminders coming in from you so if you are a teacher or a parent you can like just say that okay how is the breakfast going or like get ready for school the school bus is about to come so these are the voice reminders that the parent sets from the app the kid is not doing anything the kid will just be able to listen to the video or the audio uh, sorry uh, like look at the graphics and listen to the audio and then perceive that okay the time is so they are just looking at the graphics they are not supposed to do anything they are just like supposed to look at it and then figure out what time is there not there is going to be any number any analog hand anything okay and then so what what did you actually measure in your user evaluation then uh what did what were we what? exactly measuring in user evaluation was like whether the kids were able to perceive that okay time is running out so uh, we like showed you that there is a filling up transition so whether they will be uh, whether they were like able to figure out whether they could understand that what this icon means because when we like did the initial study when i said we were doing the contextual inquiry and all they were all dealing with uh, flash cards on papers so we were not very sure that how they are going to uh, respond to like things with digital uh, means in digital uh, digital icons and all plus then there are very uh, various features when it comes to like this cannot be applied uh, so and so like to each and every kid because usually in severe cases kids do have factors of drooling and all so when you like keep that in consideration uh, i don't think this product even will work because uh, that's like uh, digital items are again very sensitive to that and how did you measure the understanding you said you were looking at yeah so uh, the understanding is like we were not directly communicating to them we were just like observing them and we were like asking the teachers to like do you think they are like understanding what is happening so the teacher were the one who were interacting with them that also in assamese which happens to be the native language where we were like conducting the research but uh, so yeah we do not even speak assamese but it was like just based on the feedback of the teachers that okay do you think this is work uh, working or not and uh, like when they suggested that you need to like put in a real picture of an apple and then okay was that effective or not so we were just observing uh, can i just play the video here oh, okay sure sure 
Um, channeling Wendy, uh, how did the parents and teachers respond to the project's yeah, focus? So, not, uh, so much, not, so, not necessarily the solution, but even even going back to your choice of... Yeah, focus. so uh, what happened is like when we were in the process of contextual inquiry, we came across this kid, this Dave, the name that you see is actually a kid there which we came across. He was having a watch, but he was actually not able to uh, means figure out whatever that was communicating. So when we were like with parents, uh, and with teachers in particular. Teachers were the people who were like, we were ma majorly interacting with. So the feedback that we got was that, okay, time perception is something that's helping in the long run to like make them self-dependent. So it's not very important that they're able to uh, like figure out that, okay, it's the time for breakfast or something because they, anyway, the teachers or the parents are going to be there as caretakers. But what is going to happen is like, if the kids are somehow perceiving this, you increase the difficulty level gradually, kids are gonna be more and more independent and that is what they want. They want, uh, means as I said, there were like users up to 20 years of age. There are people who like pass out of the school if, when they're like 10 years of age because they're like self-dependent or like somebody offers them a job and there is somebody who's even of 20 years age but the mental age is very low. So that was uh, what the teacher said. So I had two possibly related questions. You. You said that, um, well, you called out that the moderate uh, clients were, you had the best, the best results with moderate yeah, clients. So, and I was uh, curious why, why, what happened with the mild clients that. Okay, so there are like four, I uh, mean, basically a kid with uh, an IQ below 70 is considered to be a little bit, means not as efficient as a someone having an IQ above 70. So then there are different categories. It's uh, severe and it's drastic below uh, mild and moderate as well. But uh, what happens is that kids with a higher IQ level here were like somehow able to interpret things uh, in a better manner. So like when you show it to them, the first time itself, they'll be like, okay, this means this. Uh, we like, what we did when we were like making them familiar with icons, we gave them paper cutout, uh, paper cutouts of different icons as to like figure out whether they're understanding what the digital icon means or not. So we are like just showing them, like making them familiar with this and kids with higher IQ level, they were like just able to rearrange that, okay, this is going to be my daily activity. I'm going to like wake up through an alarm and then uh, come up with uh, like say the breakfast or whatever. So. That's what, and I guess this is because uh, kids with lower IQ level do not process things easily. So this will be way more effective in kids with lower IQ level. For the higher IQ level, you need to like increase in some difficulty. So like say you increase in some visuals or just for uh, like out of the blue, you can like come up with a watch where you have just the hour hand, not the minute or the second hand. So you like progressive way of like uh, teaching them. So means if you put in all three things all at the same time, that's gonna like confuse them only. So like you put in the hour hand, if they're like figure out the hour hand and then put in the minute hand and you obviously will need to like um, complement it with the visuals because that's what they strongly relate to. Okay, so now I, I do believe my second question is related, which is um, there, there was one slide that was a little bit suggestive of this, but to what extent have you thought about the transitioning giving them more independent skills, the things that you're saying are your ultimate goal of getting them to actually be perceiving time better as opposed to Yeah, so uh, like what this means is like, as I said, you need to like put in progressive levels. So it would again depend on the performance. Means there are instances, there are exercises that the kids do carry out in schools and then they learn everything in like just say a month and then they move on to the next step. And then there are kids who are like, again, carrying out exercises, they do not learn anything, and then they are like doing the same thing for a year. So it would be like very uh, personalized as in, but then it has to be monitored by the parents. And then like, just say for the idea of time perception, you introduce the R hand. As a parent or as a teacher, I feel that, okay, you are performing everything, you are able to answer to my questions, you know what it means to be like 4 a.m. and 5 a.m. So I'll now introduce the minute hand and gradually increasing it's the complexity. It's four o'clock. Okay, <laughs> talking about time. Um, related to that, the goal of, of making the transition, uh, did you conduct any parallel design together with, uh, also with participation of parents or teachers to explore different design alternatives uh, or did you just, just come up with that? Uh... Ma'am, uh, means when it was about transitions, we were like highly concerned about transitions. So our first two visits like after the 
paper prototype and all like when we were like ready to like demonstrate what the purpose is we were like we went with a lot of transitions that how about like you say things move from to, uh, here to here like you move things from here to here so what exactly means if the kids are able to perceive was our primary concern so we were like whether they are able to figure out that okay the timer is running out or the transition is happening and what this transition means or not so uh, basically when we when we started we had like seven or eight iterations and uh, the number of iterations that we presented to them based on the feedback with caretakers was only two because the caretakers ruled out like five of them six of them so There were a lot of questions, so we are short on time. But so I'll request the judges to go and retire, as they say, and then <laughs> discuss and come back to us with a winner. And we'll wait here with bated breath till then. Or what should we do? Can I play the video? Again? Yeah, we will play the video. Thank you. <laughs> this is the time right now. Dave understands that he's supposed to look at the watch. He replies, "It is. I don't know. He cannot figure out the time. He gets confused when he sees numbers." let alone the complex digital watches or hands of the analog watch. How is he supposed to know when to do what on his own? Introducing Sati. Sati is a smart watch which uses visuals similar to flashcards that Dave is accustomed to through his daily classes. Instead of analog hands or digits, Sati represents the time through graphics that Dave easily understands. For example, the alarm symbolizes the time to wake up, the toothbrush tells is the time to brush the teeth. Let's again ask Dave, can you tell the time now? And yes, Dave will reply, it's the time for lunch. But who sets this timetable for Dave at the first place? His mom and his teacher. We refer them as master and admin respectively according to the different set of permissions assigned to them with respect to the application. And how does he set this timetable? The watch is synced with mommy's phone and she can see the schedule of events set for Dave, which were set by her and his teachers combined. She can now add events, choose presets for events and set voice reminders. Further, the voice reminders ascertain that Dave is in match with the desired task pace. But what is the role of a teacher here? Teacher is the one who has access to school slot timetable of students like Dave. One of the most important features that Sati has is that it has a master and an admin that can add pictures of real objects from life to serve the purpose of digital flashcards. This is our concept for Sati. It not only makes children like they more independent but also strengthens the relationship between caretaker and the child. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Me.